So let's just take a few minutes and kind of first look at this idea of holy war that, that we see at the beginning of this. And then we're going to look at the idea of obedience. So when we think of, uh, I want you to, this is really uh, kind of timely today in, in the world. If you look at the, the conflict going on over in Israel and, and, and the battle. And so, so on October the 7th, was it October the 7th was when, uh, when the, uh, the Arabs attacked Israel, caught them off guard, killed, raped, murdered uh, infants, did the things that are described here even, did all of that against Israel in that, in that moment. And then since then, Israel has been attempting to respond. Now, on the world stage, and, and I think the, the majority voice from the world stage now says Israel should be responding to Palestine or the Palestinians in what way? What is the expectation of the U.S. government in terms of Israel's response? What is the general expectation of the world in regards to Israel's response? If you watch the news, those of you that are connected to the news, what, what is the expectation? Okay. So you're, Fred's talking about the proper, the land. And so they expect Israel to give that ground back to them. That's, that's true. Not to, retaliate. Not to retaliate. In fact, they keep calling for ceasefire. And, and, and they're, they're negotiating to try to get hostages back. And so we've seen, we've seen maybe, if you watch the news, you see the Israel soldiers, the IDF, walking through the streets of, of Gaza, uh, trying to root out the, the, uh, the enemy uh, soldiers. And, and, and how are they conducting themselves in that? Is it, is it ruthless? Is it without discretion? It's actually not. It's very much with discretion. It's very, it's very, it's not ruthless. They're, they're attempting to, to go through in this very precise manner and, and root them, root them out. They're trying to do that. Why are they trying to do that? Because that's the expectation. That's what the world's saying. And so, and so they're, they are responding in this very kind of, I don't want to say gentle, because they're still killing people, but, but they're trying to be very selective in, in rooting out who it is that's, that's done that. And so Palestinians attacked ruthlessly with no regard to the, the age of the victim, uh, doing the most horrific war crimes possible, and now Israel trying to respond in a more gracious kind of way, if, if that's the right, the right word. And so, really, a complete flip here of this. So, so, when we look at that, would we want, would you want to read on the news that Israel is going through Palestine just killing women and children and leveling everything? Would you want to see that? No, no we wouldn't, would we? Now, that's not what we would, we would want to see. And I also don't think it's what God is calling them to do. You know, this is a, is a, is a different moment in history, and there's a, a purpose behind it. But, but we can't look at, at this from 1 Samuel chapter 15 and say, this is what we got to do. we gotta, we got to just wipe out every living thing if we're going to engage in, in, in war. I don't believe that's what God is calling us to. But he did very specifically call Israel to that in that, in that time, in that, in that moment in history. And so, what's the purpose behind it? Well, right back to the root of this. Israel was moving from its captivity in Egypt into the Holy Land. And there were those who assisted in that, the Kenites. There were those who tried to, in, to, tried to be a barrier to that. That was the Amalekites. And so what God is doing here is taking care of Israel. This 
holy war that we look at here in 1 Samuel chapter 15 is, is, the, is dedicated to the preservation of Israel. And so God's holy war in this text was dedicated to the preservation of Israel. Israel was not going to be destroyed. Israel was going to continue. So, so we, we look at the ruthlessness of that, but we look at the world today. And, and when we look at the world today, it should help us to understand the ruthlessness of that time. That the fact was this, that the world was going to, in fact, look at a map. Look at a map of the Arab world that surrounds that little slice of land that's Israel. And they want nothing more than to completely wipe that off the map. And so throughout history, God has preserved Israel, has, has, has protected Israel. And, and, and so that meant to preserve Israel, those who, who attempted to wipe Israel out and will continue to wipe Israel out, attempt to, had to be dealt with, had to be destroyed. And so, first we see that. Now, why was that so important? And remember the time of this. This, is, this would be uh, a, 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 about a thousand years before the time of Jesus, this, this, what's going on here with Saul. And so, in that time frame, Israel, Israel was eventually, what was the eventual purpose of Israel? What, what was always the purpose of Israel? But, what's that? To be, to be preserved, but for what reason? What did God intend Israel to be? I couldn't hear you, Sam. Yes, and, and, and ultimately that was going to be Christ. That's right. And so Israel, Jesus is going to come from Israel. God spends thousands of years preserving Israel so that Jesus would come from Israel. Je Jesus was a Jew. Jesus came from the line of Judah. He was born out of, of in, in the lineage of Israel. And so all of this, what we would see is so hard to understand in, in, the, in the way that God is dealing with the, the pagan nations of that day that want to destroy Israel is ultimately it's intended to preserve Israel. And even today that's still being the case. Because look, it, through the years, every time that they, they create, they, they create a, they give some ground. Israel Okay, you can have Gaza. You can have the West Bank. Every time they give some ground, what happens? What has historically happened every time? More war. They fight more. And they, and they use that ground to launch attacks in, in, into Israel. The saying, this is what the Arabs say, from, from the river to the sea. And what does that mean? It means to destroy it means to wipe them off of the earth. That's, that is the passion and the purpose of those that will call themselves the Palestinians. And so, and so God in these what seem to be horrific, ruthless actions is, is intended to preserve Israel. To, to make sure that Israel continues so that the Savior would be born. And now today the Savior's come from Israel, but God has promised that Israel will remain in some, in, in some fashion uh, until he returns. And so, holy war dedicated to the preservation of Israel. Have you, have you watched any of the, uh, any, did you watch any of the college administrators, the college presidents that spoke before Congress Anybody watch any of that from Harvard, MIT, and Penn? They, they had these three college administrators, presidents, and, and they were talking about the anti-Semitism, which is hatred for Israel, hatred for Jewish people. They were talking about that and asking them questions about it. And they asked them this question. They said, is it ever okay to call for the genocide of the Jewish people. 
So that means the killing of the of the, the Jew. Is it ever okay to to call for that, to say that on on your campus? Each of these administrators, and all three of them, they obviously had conspired, but they they all three said this. Well, it depends on the context. It depends on the context. And, 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 and the, 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 uh, those that were questioning were like, you, you're, you're kidding me. It's a yes or no question. Either it's okay to call for the genocide of Israel or it's not okay. There's never context involved in that. And, and one of them actually was fired as a result of that. The others, they're still holding their, their positions and probably will continue to. But that's, that is the irrational hatred of Israel, <clears throat> hatred towards Israel that's seen. And even in the United States where we're, we don't have a Palestinian background, I, most of us have no Jewish background, but we, we, we would never, we would never say, oh yeah, it's okay to call for the destruction of Israel. We wouldn't even say that about Palestine. And yet that's, that's the view, this irrational crazy hatred towards the people of Israel. And, and it's because that God has dedicated much of the, the Old Testament to protecting and preserving Israel. And, and I believe continues today. And if you follow the history, I want to go too far into this, but if you follow the history of Israel, back in 1967, I think that when the Arab world kind of conspired and they all got together and they warned the people that lived in the, in, in the what would be Israel's ground, that they were, going to, they were going to assault, they were going to destroy Israel. They gave them that warning. And, 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 they, and many of them fled. They, they left because they didn't want to be in that war zone. And, and on came the attack from the Arabs and, and Israel, in that little tiny nation, held them off, defeated them, actually gained more ground as a result of the assault to take their ground. And yet, you know what happened? Israel gave it back. <laughs> Israel get, returned that, that, that land to them. And so it's a, it's the, the history of Israel is one of just the divine protection of God, that he is preserving them. He is taking care of them. And, and it's why we as Christians, uh, maybe, maybe we don't understand why it's important to us. We might think that that's a world away and has nothing to do with me, but it's very much connected to, to the story of Scripture, to, to our salvation in Christ who came from Israel. And, and in some way, we will, Israel will again be prominent in God's kingdom at some point. God's holy war also uh, was intended to bring about his righteous judgment to wickedness. So, so these people who had done wicked things against Israel are now getting their just desserts. And so when we look at, at God's ruthless actions on the nations, understand that that's judgment. And, and in fact, at some point in history, his ruthless judgment is going to go on anyone who, is, who has rejected Christ, who does not have a relationship with Jesus. And so God's holy war is intended to bring about his righteous judgment and wickedness. And so it, it, we'll go back to what we said in the beginning. If we're put in a position where we feel like we have to defend this, we have to... We have to defend God in this. Really, I think just two very important points. One is that God is always working, working to preserve Israel because from Israel would come our salvation. And God is always working in retributive justice to those who would do things, uh, horrific crimes against Israel or, or humanity in, in general. So let's move on then to the obedience that Saul refuses to have in this, uh, but I think relates maybe more 
to us in this. And the first one is this. It is that obedience must be connected to the precise commands of God. So we use the word there, precise. Why? Because we have this notion that if we do some obedience, if I'm partially obedient, then, then that will please God. That, that if I'm, I'm trying, and so I'm doing some of what God says for me to do, that I'll be okay. Samuel, or Samuel, Saul in this case, thinks that partial obedience is good enough. This'll, this will please God. And yet, pleasing God is connected to full obedience to God, living fully in obedience to Him. And so Saul's partial obedience was, was not enough. There's a quote from Henry Blackaby on your, on your uh, bulletin, and it says, and then a partial one on the, the, the slide there. God's commands are designed to guide you to life's very best. You will not obey him if you do not believe him and trust him. You cannot believe him if you do not love him. You cannot love him unless you know him. And what, what Black and he's saying is that, that these commands that God gave to Israel, to, to Saul, were intended to be for his good, for his benefit. They were intended to be for the benefit of Israel, the preservation of Israel. And, and, and so God's commands intended for good. They're intended to bring out, they're, they're intended to lead us to that which God has, to, which is best for us. And so we oftentimes think this way, that we think that what is best for me will require me to not act in obedience to God. What I want, I'm going to have to, it's going to require some disobedience for me to get to that place that I want to be, or to get that which I want to have. And so I'm, I'm willing to act in disobedience to get what I want. And what Blackaby's pointing out here, and I, and I believe this story indicates, is that, is that getting that which is best for us comes from obedience. And so, and so in, in this story, Saul thinks that which is best, the, the, uh, the, the, the flocks, the, the sheep, the king, whatever he thought he was going to get out of the king, he thinks that that is going to be what is best for us. And yet, God points out that that is not the case. Obedience to God is oftentimes extremely difficult. Why was it difficult here? This, this is easy. Don't, don't read too deep into this. Why was the command to Saul and what he was required to do, why was that difficult? Why would it be difficult for you? Now, well, that, that's interesting. There'd be good stuff that would be wasted. That, see, that, that, that's interesting that Jesse says that's true. But, man, there's like a really bigger one than that. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 <laughs> the, yes, killing all the women and children. Infants, it even says. Would that be hard? I would hope so. Yes, I mean, that, that, that would be extremely difficult. And you know what? God doesn't give us a command like that and think that, that, that it, oh, well, this is going to be easy for you. You know? God understands our, our human condition, and, and how hard that would be? Now, yes, Teresa. They killed the women and children and kept the cattle. I know, I, I know. <laughs> I, I know. That. <laughs> yes. That's gross. Yeah. <laughs> Teresa, Teresa points out that they killed the women and children and kept the cows. That, yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, that, that in itself calls into question the... the uh, maybe leads us more into the line of Jesse's thinking, that the cows were more valuable. Maybe. <laughs> but, but again, this would, be, this would be extremely difficult to carry this out. It, w it would be. I mean, I, you know, I've never, I've never been in combat, but, but I, I got to think that if I was put in combat, it would be very difficult to to fire a gun at another human being. 
But this is even beyond that. Obedience is oftentimes extremely difficult. Now, let's bring it down into our own life and think about areas where we're called to obedience, where it has been very hard to obey. And it hasn't required half of what was required here. It's something much less than that, and yet we're still like, oh my goodness, God, I don't think I can do that. I don't want to do that. And so obedience is oftentimes very difficult and I think always challenging to us. The second part of that is that obedience to God is oftentimes extremely unpopular because obedience to God here, according to Saul, the people that wanted the cattle were the soldiers, were the people that went along with them. So if he's going to be obedient to God, what's he going to have to do? He's going to have to stand up and say, whoa, God said everything goes. We destroy everything. That would have been unpopular. The people wouldn't have really cared for that, I'm guessing. And so the same thing's true in, in our own life. Sometimes we have to make decisions that are unpopular. Unpopular with our families, with our friends. I don't know. In our, in, in our workplaces, we, we, we have to do things, we have to say things, because God has called us to, to some type of obedience that is not going to make us liked by the crowd at large. And, and, and Saul wasn't willing to risk that. He wasn't going to do what was right in God's eyes, and, and in doing so, tarnish his reputation with the rest of the soldiers and the people. And so in this, I think it's important we look at this, and it is the idea of intentions. There was someone who, who once said, I think it was, I think it's Craig Rochelle that said that, Pastor Craig Rochelle said that we judge other people based on their actions and we judge ourselves based on our intentions. We look at what somebody else does and we are going to judge them based on that. But us, it's really, we're going to evaluate ourselves based on what were my intentions? What did I, what was I hoping would happen as a result of that? And, and so for Saul, there's probably an element of that here. That, well, here's my intentions. We, I wanted to bring this stuff in so, so we, could, we could offer sacrifice and we could have this great worship event for you. And so Saul wants to be evaluated on his intentions. And yet, pleasing God is never going to be based on our intentions. It's going to be on our actual actions, what we've actually done. And so pleasing God results from actual obedience, not intentions. And so we get to the end of this, and, and this verse uh, uh, 20, 23 I think really kind of uh, then captures everything, kind of summarizes it all, where he makes these comparisons in, in sins. And the first one is this, and it is that we need to understand this, and it is to reject God's clearly revealed will is equal to searching for his will in mysticism or witchcraft, something like that. He compares it to that. He says there's no difference. Now, why is that? I mean, think about this. God has revealed what his will is for us. In the story of, of Saul here, God's will was revealed through the words of Samuel. Here's what God has said to you, Saul. This is what you're to do. For you today, God's will has been revealed in his word. It, it, what he wants for you, what his his explicit commands for you are found there in his word. Now, I'm not talking about little things in your life that you're not sure. Should I take this job? Should I take that job? Uh, uh, should I marry this person? Uh, you know, I'm talking about those things that God's word is very precise and clear about. And what he's saying is that when we look at that and we say, well, I don't see the answer there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look elsewhere. I'm going, to, I'm going to search for the understanding in my own heart and my own mind. He said that's equal to mysticism. That's like, that's like going to a, 
a, a, a, a, a, a fortune teller. That's what he describes it as. Because instead of embracing that which is clear, I'm going to pretend that I have to go find that answer somewhere else. And he says, that's like going to a mystic. That's like looking for that answer in, in mysticism. And so when we do that, when we search outside of God's word for his will in that way, he equates it with that. Now, we don't like to think of that. We would say, I would never go, I would never go to a mystic. And yet God says, when you reject his clear, clearly worded word, then that's what you're doing. The second thing is this, and it is to choose our own way instead of what has been revealed in God's word is equal to idolatry is what he says. We made an idol. So God has said, here's what God has said, and I'm saying, you know what? I, I think I know better, and so I'm going to go my own direction. And what he's saying is you, you've created an idol. You have put an idol up, and you are pursuing that idol instead of God. And so two things that maybe in our culture today, we'd be like, oh, I wouldn't have nothing to do with mysticism. I wouldn't have anything to do with idolatry. And yet what he says is, when you reject the clear word of God for something else, you're headed off into mysticism and into idolatry. You are chasing after an idol instead of God himself. And those are... The, the reasons, the, what leads us to, to see the, 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 the danger in disobedience to God. That, that Saul's kingdom hinges on this. Now, we, we know that he previously had already kind of squandered his opportunity, but now this is just like the, the, the nail in the coffin on how important obedience is in the life of the believer. And so, uh, brings us to this really pretty much the end of, of Saul's, uh, Saul's ministry here, or ministry, his kingdom is pretty much, not that he doesn't remain king, but we're going to get into this process of transition where David now is going to be introduced to the story and, and begins that, that tension between the two of them over the last years of, of Saul's kingdom.